Do you have trouble sleeping at night? Try Calm for imaginative sleep stories, relaxing music, or meditations. Now you can get 40% off of a premium subscription by going to calm.com slash holly. That's C-A-L-M dot com slash holly for 40% off of a premium subscription. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have Deals, or also known as Adelia Acker. She is an OnlyFans star. She's also a podcaster, and she could sort of be like my younger twin. We have like the same <laughs> hair. Um, so let's welcome Adelia. Hi. Woo. You obviously try harder with your hair, but <laughs> I, I, I did. I did put some work into it, but I'm telling yeah. you, like, I will send you a picture of my hair like when I don't do it. Uh-huh. Actually, if you look back at some of my older podcast episodes, I got lazy and I didn't do my hair. It looks yeah. so much Just like, like yeah. I mean, so much like yours. It's crazy. <laughs> crazy. I, I can't figure out how to do like the hair spin. Like I have the me. perfect one in the bathroom. That's what I was doing my oh. hair in this morning. I can give you a little <laughs> tutorial afterwards if you want to. <laughs> yeah, I can show you great. how, because it took me forever to figure out how to do my hair. I used to blow dry it. I used uh-huh. to get like the Brazilian blowout all the time. And that ruins your hair, right? Ruins your hair. I've been growing my hair out since last August and I just, I've kept cutting the ends off because mm-hmm. um, I got Brazilian blowouts for like four years straight. Yeah, but it's such a nightmare. And then the minute there's any like, um, you know, frizziness or moisture in the air, it's just like, whoosh, yeah. it's like a fucking poodle. <laughs> I just want to say like, I feel your pain with the hair. It's mm-hmm. like, it's hard, but it's cute. And Thank I like you. that you keep it natural. You're, you're a very like, natural girl. I mean, that's like your thing, right? Kind of like girl next door. I mean, my tits are like fake. My mm-hmm. lips are fake. Um, I've had like, I had the buckled cheek fat removal and a chin implant, but I look natural. <laughs> you do. So tell us, how did you start on that journey? How did you, when did you start your OnlyFans? I started my OnlyFans. I think it was, it was October of 2020. Um, I had been considering it for so long, like so long. I had a job, I worked corporate and, um, it was just to the point where I was like throwing up from stress and like getting just like progressively sicker. And like, I couldn't like leave my bedroom basically on weekends because of how tired I was. And, um, I took acid one day. Mm -hmm. I was like, why don't I make an OnlyFans? And then I'm like, hmm, it just seems like I'd be scared of what everyone else thought of me Um, because my parents are really religious. My dad has been calling me a whore since high school before I was a whore. So, um, you know, I was just really scared of like the reactions I would get. And um, I lived in Arizona at the time where people are a lot more... um, conservative. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Not everyone has a slutty Instagram I did. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what are my friends going to think about me? And then um, when I was tripping on acid, I was like, I just don't really care at this point. Like, and then within 24 hours of making one, I made a whole month's salary at my corporate job where I was working 12 hour days, (laughs) Wow. sometimes more. So that was like really fun. (laughs) So how do you think that, um, leaving your corporate job, Mm -hmm. starting an OnlyFans, becoming like your own boss and entrepreneur. How do you think that that's helped you grow as a person? Um, It's helped me grow, uh, oh my God, in so many ways. I I feel like OnlyFans has made, it's cultivated a confidence in me that I've never fucking had because all my life I've been like, I mean, I was still a people pleaser when I started OnlyFans just in a different way. It's like, I didn't even want to start an OnlyFans for months because I was such a people pleaser that I wanted to please everyone around me before myself. Um, you didn't want to like disappoint your friends and your family. Yeah. (laughs) So, uh, so when I like started my only fans, I was like, Oh my God, I have like the power to make money. And then also I was like, not the most confident with the way I looked. And I'm like, all of a sudden, like making really like sexy content. Well, my content, I wouldn't say it's like sexy. It's like quirky in a sexual way. Okay, (laughs) I, I give off very like girl next door, not very sexual energy while being sexual. I don't know Mm -hmm. how to describe it. Um, 
But I was like looking at myself like masturbating and I'm like, oh, I'm like getting a little turned on by myself. And I was like getting more in tune with like my own sexuality. Um, but the longer I had been in the OnlyFans space, I mean, there have just been so many people to take advantage of me, get me in bad contracts. Uh, even friends try to exploit me for their own personal gain. And like just it's taught me to kind of I mean, I guess like most people would be like, you're a cold hearted bitch. But it's really like I'm setting boundaries for myself. So I stop having like that constant stress of everyone else around me. Yeah. So a lot of people in Hollywood are leeches. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, tell me about it. Yeah. Um, so what kind of content do you do on there? Is it just solo girl or do you perform with other people? Mm. So I have done a lot of girl girl in the past. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a few boy girl. Um, I only have like, I think I have like three or four sex tapes or something like that. And then I have like a few blowjob videos. Um, I just don't really feel that safe around men. Mm. So I I just am a lot more comfortable filming with women because I know that they're going to respect my boundaries. It's a very welcoming, open environment. And I just don't really feel that way around men mm. at all. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, the good thing about running your own OnlyFans is that you can make that decision yeah. for yourself. <laughs> so. I mean, here's the thing. If I start dating someone... Like one of my requirements is that he fucks me and films it <laughs> for my OnlyFans. That is like a requirement for me. But I haven't like dated any. I mean, I haven't had sex since October. I haven't dated anyone in like years. <laughs> so why is that a requirement? Is it what? Yeah. Why is that a requirement? Um, Because I need to gain financially. <laughs> <laughs> Like I have wanted to make sex tapes with people to put on my OnlyFans. Like it's something I want to do. And also like if I'm fucking someone I actually really, really like it, like it translates to the camera. Like people are going to be like, oh my God, her content just went from this to mm -hmm. this. Um, so that's why it's, a, I mean, it's just, it's like going to take my page to the next level. Yeah. And I've met a lot of guys who are so down to make content with me. Um, so I don't think that'll be an issue. I also just think it kind of like weeds out anyone who would have issues with OnlyFans too. That's like what, say, that was my first thought when yeah. you said that was weeding out guys who might like uh -huh. have, you know, come back and be like, I don't want you putting your body out there and but, you're, you know. So many of my friends, they'll be like, okay with it when they first start dating. And then all of a sudden they get drunk one night and then they're like, you're a whore for your OnlyFans. And it's like, I can be like, you're a whore for putting your dick on my OnlyFans. Yeah. What do you mean? Right, right, right. Yeah, no, that makes sense. <laughs> So, um, you mentioned that you grew up in an, and, and wow, I, why can't I say that? Evangelical. <laughs> I couldn't say that word for a second. Evangelical Christian household. Um, mm -hmm. so like, tell us a little bit about what that was like and how did it affect your relationship with sex growing up? Um, so I feel like I was always more sexual growing up. Like I was over here in elementary school trying to find ways to like watch porn without it being a sin. Mm -hmm. So I was watching like anime porn and stuff like that as an elementary school person. Cause I thought that that wasn't going to be a sin. Cause it wasn't real people. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then like middle school, I was over here. Like as soon as my parents left, I was putting on like Jersey shore and like girls next door in like admiring the playboy models and like their little thongs. And it's like, my mom would never get me thongs. So it's like, I would like steal thongs as like being in middle school. And then when I got to high school, my mom still didn't want me to get like thong bikini bottoms. And my parents would try to say like, no guy is going to want to date you if you wear these short shorts or wear like this kind of stuff. And I was just always like, this sounds so fucking stupid to me. And that's actually why I left Christianity because I'm like, why the fuck would I like have less fun in my real life for a stupid fucking afterlife that I don't even know how it's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, so then I like left Christianity and I was like, and then I started getting kicked out of the church on purpose. Um, my parents would try to like make me go and I'd bring really short shorts to where they're like, you either have to change or you have to get out. And I'm like, just kick me out, just kick me out. And then I'd walk home. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it just like, translated to so many areas in my life. And it's like, my parents would always try to change me. Like my mom would throw out my shorts when I wasn't home or like they would basically try to shame me into being different or looking different. And then as soon as I graduated high school, after my parents sent me to Mormon rehab in Utah for seven months, um, 
as soon as I got out, <laughs> my friend took like a Polaroid of me where I was like naked, but like it was like from my back. And I posted that on Instagram. And then I went to my first rave, my first rave ever wore little pasties, um, which people were like, I know you're going to be a raver because no one does that. And just this like whole showing my skin was always so appealing to me. I just felt so comfortable and confident doing it. And I just think everyone tried to slut shame the slut out of me and it never worked. Yeah. Everyone tried to change me. Like people in college, my freshman year at the university of Arizona, Halloween, I had girls yelling at me, calling me a whore for my Halloween outfit. And I'm like, you're in lingerie. I'm just showing more skin. Like I didn't understand why girls were yelling at me. Um, or when I started posting all this crazy stuff on Instagram, specifically like my sophomore year of college, um, people would try to make up rumors that I was like a stripper or a prostitute on the side because no one was used to someone like showing that much skin. Now I think it's a lot more normalized, but I just think I've always been like this. Right. Even though my parents would try to like shame it out of me. And my dad, like especially in college, would send me paragraphs about like how I look like a two cent whore and I'm ashamed of the family. And it's like, I mean, I haven't blocked now because I'm like, I just, I can't deal with these text messages anymore. <laughs> yeah. So I assume that you don't have a good relationship with your parents right now. My mom, I actually do. Okay. My dad, I don't. <laughs> okay. But um, my mom has also been getting a lot of help in the past like few years. We went to a family therapist growing up who was actually like really like she was sexist, didn't like sex workers. Like uh, she, she was she was bad. But finally, I, I left a few years ago and my mom finally left. And then she started actually going to like good people who are good for helping her. And now she's just like, I'm just going to like look the other way and pretend like this isn't happening. So we can like have that good relationship since she's still very Christian. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that she views Christianity as being judgmental and like wanting to change people and being controlling. Like she doesn't view it like that. I think a lot of most other people do, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, I think we've, we've grown a lot. Yeah. So you said that you went to a Mormon rehab. Yeah. What, what is that? Um, so it's like one of those, uh, troubled teen centers that like Paris Hilton went to. Um, okay. If you saw like that documentary that she had where mm. they're, they are like crazy. Um, I failed a drug test for weed when I was like 17. And then my mom found like my fake IDs, which I'm like, how, like, you know, I drink, like how else do you think I'm buying alcohol? And then, um, I thought I was like good to go. I didn't even know I failed the drug test for weed. I thought I was straight chilling. And then, um, like a week or two later, people came to my house and were like, you're coming with me. And I'm like, no, I'm not. And then my mom was behind them and she's like, yes, you are. And then um, they were like really buff people. And they were like, if you try to run, we'll tackle you. And I'm like, well, I don't want to be tackled. So I just like went with them. My mom turned my phone off and they drove me all the way to Southern Utah um, where I went to two different rehabs. Uh, the first one my parents like figured out it was bad pretty early on. They told my mom I was in school there. They didn't even have a teacher. Like they didn't have any school. I wasn't getting anything done. And my mom was like, well, she needs to fucking graduate. So then she sent me to one down the street. Both were fairly emotionally abusive, I'd say. Um, like the first one, I wasn't even allowed to speak. Like I did not have the right to speak for the whole six weeks I was there. Um, I was allowed to ask to go to the bathroom to staff. I was allowed to talk if the therapist was present, which was like, I don't know, twice a week, something like that. But other than that, we were not allowed to speak to each other wow. um, or even like have conversations with the staff. Some staff would kind of fold, but like I did not have the right to speak. Um, and then they would make me like rewrite my letters to home to make it sound like it's the best place ever. So I didn't even have like that option to tell my parents how it really was. The second place was like definitely better. There, I know there was like abuse happening there too. Um, like two teachers got arrested for child pornography. Jeez. Um, so, and those were teachers there for a very long time. Um, I guess they were selling pornography of their adopted kids and they had like 12. And I'm just assuming that they had some of the girls because one of them was the soccer coach. I'm just assuming that yeah. there's something about us in there. <laughs> um, so since there was cameras in like every single room. Okay. So these are people that are working at a facility that's supposed to like help you, but they help. all exploit you. So, okay. So you said, um, for like endangered teens, like what are they considered endangered teens? Is it like, Oh, it's like a trouble teen. Um, so like your parents can send you for any reason, for whatever. um, because they want money. They're not right. in it 
to help you. Right. No one, no one is there to help you. Yeah. Um, not even the fucking therapist, because the therapists lie to your parents about your progress, progress, so that they keep you there longer. The therapists work with like the campus leaders to lie to your parents to get you to stay longer. And they lie about everything happening in like the facility and the rehab. Um, the Mormon staff there, specifically the men, and some of the Mormon women too would call all the girls campus whores. And the woman, even in this rehab, didn't have as many rights as the men. The men could go unsupervised on the football fields. They had better field trips. They even got a field trip to like a race car track. The woman, we didn't have any of that shit. So what were some of the, like, what were the classes? Like, what what were you doing all day? Um, I ended up graduating in like three months because that's all I did all day, every day. I didn't get along with a lot of other people in the rehab. Um, at least when I first got there, like I was there for weed. And there were some people there who were like either in gangs or um, you know, there for actual drug addictions. And then I was just like, yeah, I filled a drug test for weed. And then I got, I got bullied really, really hard until I became friends with my friend Colby, who is like six, two. Mm -hmm. And she's like, if you guys fuck with her, you have to go through me basically. And then that's when people started being kind of nice to me. Mm -hmm. I was terrified for my first like month or two there. So was it kind of like a regular school where they were teaching you, or they were supposedly teaching you a regular curriculum? You would just had a really like strict um, parameters or were they teaching you like, were there like, was it like an anti-drug program where they're like um, anti like abstinence classes, like stuff like that? Uh, I wouldn't say there were any like a abstinence classes or even like anti-drug classes. You had a therapist that you met with once a week, okay. but I hated my therapist, hated him. I still hate you if you're watching, but I don't think he pays attention because like I caught him in so many lies to my parents to the point that he was like, begging for my forgiveness being like I'm so sorry and I'm like you lost your chance like I was like requesting another therapist so my parents pulled me early because mm -hmm. they're like this is like they were like we're sorry yeah. for putting you through all of this um but there were normal teachers like I I took normal online classes I took uh uh what is it it's not AP honors I took honors all honors classes so mm -hmm. I had like a four point to GPA or something leaving the school. Mm -hmm. And then I started taking college classes while I was there because I was just like so bored. I graduated so soon. I just thought like, oh, I graduated so early. Like I technically graduated in 2014. So I was like, my parents need to pull me early. No, I was there for another like three months. <laughs> um, so my mistake for thinking that. So then I was like, okay, I guess I'll take like a college class. Like I don't know what else to do with my days. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it was like a school, but it was like a, it was kind of like a, a continuation Mon school. We call it like continuation schools here. Yeah. It was like Monday through Friday. We would have school from like eight to three, kind of like normal. And then after that we'd have like, we'd have to go like to a yard and like do something active. Mm -hmm. But like my stress was so bad that I had like tendonitis from like the bottom of my ankles to my knees. So I couldn't even do anything active. That is just like a stress response. Yeah. Like I wasn't doing anything else to like cause that kind of reaction, but it was just stress. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like fun. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break and then we'll be right back. Hang tight. Every day we hear about how our morning rituals can change our day, but have you thought about your evening rituals? Allowing ourselves time to transition and wind down from our devices and our minds in the evening allows us to stop our racing thoughts and to drift off to sleep naturally. Power your day by powering off at night. Reduce stress and anxiety through guided meditations, improve focus with curated music tracks, and rest and recharge with Calm's imaginative sleep stories. My mom has been having a lot of trouble sleeping lately, and I turned her on to Calm. Now, she's not a fan of the meditation. She says she doesn't like people telling her what to do, but the calming music tracks really help her sleep at night. What I mean is that you don't have to be into meditation to use Calm. I use it for meditation, but my mom uses it for the sleep stories and for the music. Whatever you need to help you relax, Calm is the right program for you. And for listeners of the show, Calm is offering an exclusive offer of 40% off of a Calm premium subscription. Just go to calm.com slash holly to get your 40% off for a limited access to Calm's entire library. That's calm.com slash holly for 40% off of your premium subscription. 
All right, guys, we are back. So, Adelia, um, you mentioned earlier that, like, you were kind of inspired to start your OnlyFans because you did acid. And then yeah. you, like, kind of, like, you know, came out of yourself and you're like, you know what? I don't care what other people think. Um, so you've mentioned before that you're, like, a fan of psychedelics. Um, oh, yeah. When did you start experimenting with them and, like, how has it changed things for you? Well, first time I rolled, I was like 15. Um, the first time I tried psychedelics was, um, my junior year of college. Okay. Um, my friend just happened to be at ultra and was like, here, try this. And he, he gave me like half a tab and in my head, I'm like, that's too much. So I tore off like an eighth of a tab, tried it. And it was, it was so fucking fun. And I'm like, I love acid. Mm -hmm. And I got so into it. I did it almost every week in my senior year because, um, after doing like Molly or ecstasy so many times, I just was kind of like over it and didn't like the come downs. Cause like I had a lot of trouble regulating ecstasy for mm -hmm. some reason. Like it always hits you at different times. And I would, I would just always tend to, to overdo it. But acid, it was really nice. Cause you take like an eighth of a tab. It takes like 20 minutes to hit you usually. And then, um, after that, you're just, you're good for the whole night. So it's a lot harder to overdo in my opinion. Yeah. And, um, so you're taking like kind of a small amount. Uh, I mean, my tolerance got really high over time, but I think a lot of people who do drugs don't know how to like portion it. Like, for example, if I take ecstasy now, I take an eighth of a press pill, mm -hmm. like not even like not even a half, which is what a lot of people do. I cut it again and then I cut it again. And that was like the perfect amount for me. And I didn't feel overboard. I just did it for my birthday. Mm. And I'm like, perfect. This was the perfect amount where I did not go overboard. A lot of people who I've talked to hate acid because they're like, oh my God, it was way too much. And I'm like, how much did you take? They're like half a tab to a tab. And I'm like, that's way too much. Like you need to take like an eighth to a fourth if you have no tolerance to mm. it. Like that's just the logical, in my opinion, that like the first time I did it, I even knew that half was going to be too much or a fourth was going to be too much. And an eighth was perfect. I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm laughing because when I was 15, um, we got, I used to do drugs in high school. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we got a sheet of acid, me and my best friend. And I did, we did acid every single weekend yeah. <laughs> for the summer when I was 15. And we always took like at least a whole tab That's and we just like trip fucking balls all day. <laughs> but my parents used to microdose like before it was a microdosing thing. So my yeah. parents would dissolve it in water. Um, and then they use an eyedropper and then they'd take like just a couple of drops of acid and then they'd go out and it would actually help keep them sober. Oh. So they like, cause if you like microdose on acid, then alcohol doesn't affect you as much. Do you find that that happens for you too? Yeah. It's actually funny. Cause like I've only gone overboard with acid. I feel like five or less times. And for the amount I've done acid, I don't think that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, so then I will drink a lot if I'm, if I went overboard with acid and then it kind of like counteracts the acid. Mm -hmm. Like they both kind of counteract each other and I kind of feel like I'm sobering up. Mm -hmm. Um, but also then I usually, you know, throw up the next day from alcohol cause yeah, it's not good for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm just thinking like I probably, cause the acid trips that I used to take, they were fucking intense and they were like, the come down was terrible and I'd feel really awful and yeah, like see, speedy and stuff like that. So, I mean, there's a lot of talk now about psychedelics, like small doses of psychedelics being really good in terms of helping with depression and like mental health issues. How finding do you think yourself? Yeah. I mean, how do you feel about, I mean, obviously finding yourself cause yeah. <laughs> if it wasn't for acid, you may not have an only fans, then we wouldn't be here today, which would be so sad. Yeah. I I think honestly acid and mushrooms have been like my knight in shining armor I can't do acid anymore it my body just I, I don't know if they've like changed the chemical composition of acid because mm -hmm. in the past year or two every time I've done acid um I've come downs and I never used to have come downs on acid so I'm like is this even real acid like why on earth am I having a come down for such like a small amount mm -hmm. like I just feel out of it like need to sleep for like 24 hours straight and I'm like, that doesn't even happen when I do ecstasy. Mm -hmm. So like, what's going on? So I stopped doing acid because I'm like, that's just like really scary. And then back in October, I only took an eighth of a tab um, for a festival called Gold Rush. I don't think it was real acid because the I was throwing up from an eighth 
from an eighth of a tab, the ground and the sky, they were like switching. I was basically kind of like stumbling around because I couldn't really find my balance. And then I just had to drink so much to kind of counteract it. And like after like six hours, I finally started feeling semi-normal, but I'm like, that was my last time doing acid. So people need to be careful. Like, please actually start testing your shit because I've been having a lot of friends like do fentanyl on accident and yeah, all that's, that stuff. <laughs> that, that's a problem with like the illegal drugs is that you don't know what you're getting. The one thing I will say is like, if you get mushrooms, you can tell if there's fentanyl because they are literally a fucking mushroom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like you can't just mix in a white powder. Yeah, that's true. For mushrooms. Um, but it's unfortunate because since I've had mold poisoning, I've had mold poisoning like all this year. Um, well, actually, I've had it for the past few years. I just found out this year and have been doing the whole mold detox this year. Um, so they're like, you can't do mushrooms right now because mushrooms are a fungus and mold is a fungus. And your body is reacting to mushrooms as if mold is reentering your body. Wow. So I have to wait. Basically, all the mold is out of my system, but there's still... Um, like there's still toxins in my body left over from the mold so that now I have to detox that out of my system. But then once that's gone, oh my God, I can't wait to do mushrooms a lot again. So were you living somewhere that obviously had a black mold problem and you oh, weren't yeah. aware of it? I I lived with black mold for like three years in college and that's when I started getting really sick and I kept going to doctors. All of them told me I was fine. And um, I like the issue with black mold First of all, I should have been taught a class on what it looks like because to me it looked like dust. It mm-hmm. literally looked like dust in my shower. It looked like dust to me under my sink. And it's like. So it doesn't actually look like black mold. Well, I mold to me before having like a trained eye, in my opinion, looked like dust. Mm. So like I didn't really know about mold. I knew what mold looked like on food. Yeah. I just assumed that's like what all mold looked like. And yeah. I just feel like no one told me anything. <laughs> So what does the black mold look like? It's not like a black like fungus that you see on the walls. Like you, it's not- it's almost like it's like black dots that are kind of like spread apart. Okay, and that's why it, it kind of just like looks like dust to me. It looks kind of like black, and then around the black, it kind of is like a gray film kind of thing. Okay, but it looks very similar to dust. Okay, so and then you started getting sick. Like what kind of symptoms were you experiencing? Um. I was like just incredibly thirsty and my body stopped absorbing a lot of things. So, um, I, I like have had IBS one due to stress, but due due to like the mold. Um, so I was really concerned when I was drinking like two gallons of water in an hour and I was peeing it all out. Like I would drink water and then pee almost immediately. Mm -hmm. And, um, my, I would be drinking that much water, which by the way, can fucking drown you. But but it wasn't drowning me because I was peeing it out immediately. Yeah. Um, my lips were literally cracking from being so dehydrated. Like my mom had to fly out, take me to urgent care. Like we had to buy all these coconut waters to try to get my body to like absorb something. Mm-hmm. And then all these doctors were like, it sounds like you have diabetes. And I'm like, like four doctors all told me, it sounds like you have diabetes. Oh, you don't have diabetes. Looks like you're fine. And um, it was mold poisoning this whole time. <laughs> wow. So what was the detox process like? Oh my, it was awful. It's like mold poisoning. It's actually in like the same family of how it like affects you um, as Lyme's disease because I think they're both uh, like biotoxins like in your body. Mm-hmm. So I had to take like these binders and like spore biotics and these like really harsh probiotics that are, they affect your body similarly to antibiotics, but they're like specifically for mold. Um, I like each pill was a little bit different. The first one was like, I could barely get out of bed. It's like, I just got over COVID. It was basically like having COVID every single day for like a month or two. Um, and then the next ones made me actually go a little crazy. Like they didn't let me sleep. So I was getting like four hours of sleep a night. And like, I was just being a cunt to everyone. And now like they know I just wasn't sleeping and like the pills made me crazy. Um, the ones afterwards just, uh, (laughs) And <laughs> they made me have like explosive diarrhea, like constantly. And like my stomach was just always painful. And I felt like throwing up every single day. And actually since taking those pills, I have not, I still feel nauseous almost every day since taking those pills. I don't know if that's like a long-term side effect. Hopefully it goes away soon, but it's just like constant nausea. And, um, and that was about five months of taking those pills. So just the combo of those. Yeah. So you're, are you fully recovered yet? Are you still like, I just got my test. Actually today I got my test results back. Um, I'm free of the black mold. There is a mold that they found, but I'm pretty sure, um, it's cause I didn't know, but I ate like a moldy, 
uh, uh, what is it? Sea moss. Um, I just, I looked at it and I'm like, is that mold? And I'm like, no, this is like literally three or four days old. Like there's no way there can be mold and sea moss that's been in the fridge. And then I ate it and then I started getting sick. And then I, I took uh, my molds test of that day. And then the next day it started growing a little bit. And I was like, oh my God, that was, that was mold. That was mold. So, um, the mold that came back and the test that just came back said, uh, it's a mold grown on rotting, uh, food. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I, <laughs> what is sea moss? Uh, oh, it's like, you, you've never heard of it. I don't think so. I mean, seaweed, obviously. But. Yeah. So sea moss, like they sell it at Erewhon. I'm not sure if they sell it at Whole Foods, but I buy everything from Erewhon usually. Um, like you take it by the spoon and I, there's like a certain amount of nutrients you're supposed to have in a day. It has, okay. I think it's only missing like five out of like over a hundred. Mm. Like it's really good for you. It's good for your skin. It's good for your health. It's good for your digestion. But I was just wondering how the fuck did it get moldy after five days? Right. So that's why I took it anyways. But I'm pretty sure I'm mold free. Okay. I just think it was like my body was like, oh, mold is in the system again because I just ate moldy sea moss. Right, right. <laughs> And it, here's the thing about sea moss too. And this is why I was like, is this mold? Because sea moss, it, it literally is kind of like a moss. Like I'm, tr- it kind of looks like applesauce. Mm-hmm. So it just kind of blended in with how it gotcha. already looks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, I'm black mold free, which is the good part. Cause that was the dangerous one. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> All right. Um, let's talk about something sexy. Mm. <laughs> the listeners like, wow, yeah. that is the most amount of mold that has ever been discussed on this podcast. <laughs> Um, you've often said that the world should normalize hooking up with your friends. Um, why do you love hooking up with your friends? So I've said this more about like my girlfriends, not my guy friends. I, I had to clear this up on like Michael Sartain's podcast because like I would get so weird if I hooked up with my guy friend, like there's just no getting around it. I don't Mm -hmm. know what it is when I hook up with a man, I get attached immediately. And I'm like, well, that's weird. I hook up with my girlfriends and it's like, we can just go back to being besties right afterwards. There's like no attachment feeling. Mm -hmm. And that's like the amazing part. And it's like, especially when I'm like, making content for OnlyFans. It's like my friend Kristen, for example, it's like she eats pussy better than like anyone I've ever met. Um, So when she ate me out, I was over here like literally fantasizing about her, but still only thinking of her like a best friend. So I'm mm-hmm. like normalize this because mm-hmm. this is awesome, especially because so I'm like bisexual, but heteroromantic. So it's like when I hook up with women, I'm so turned on. I love it. But like afterwards, I'm just back to being like besties. And that's Mm -hmm. like just great to me. So normally is hooking up with you, especially like girls for your girlfriends, because they'll know how to like lick your clit better than a man ever will. In Mm -hmm. my opinion, men suck at that stuff. They (laughs) like I've literally dated men who don't even know how to like put a vibrator on my clit. Like they're just missing it entirely. Yeah. Do you think that um, I mean, have you ever, so have you ever been with a guy who's been, you know, really bad at eating you out? And Every guy, except for, um. Do you give them direction? Here's the thing. <laughs> I have, well, okay, so for actually most guys, because like, for example, I didn't even think I liked being eaten out until my friend Kristen ate me out. It mm-hmm. was Kristen and Sarah, and we were all doing like a three-way It was, she was actually like, Kristen was teaching like a pussy eating class in this video that we have. It's on OnlyFans if you guys want it. (laughs) Um, But she was teaching us how to eat pussy. And I was over here like, all right, I'm going to have to like fake this blah, blah, blah. And then like, we started filming the video and I was like, and this was only last year. First person to ever eat me out and be good. Hmm. So, and I haven't really hooked up with a guy since. I just thought I didn't like being eaten out. So I always told guys like, just don't even bother eating me out. Like you're going to be. It's kind of like, I, I just always thought I didn't like being eaten out. And it just turned out everyone who had tried eating me out sucked. And I just thought I, I'm not sensitive enough. Like I would just always hand guys vibrators. They can't even take direction for vibrators. So you, okay. So you haven't been eaten out by a guy since you hooked up with this girl. I haven't been eaten out by a guy in probably like six or seven years. Wow. Oh. And I would just like always give guys vibrators. And even then, like the the guy who I made OnlyFans content with, the only guy, and I haven't hooked up with anyone since him. He I told him, like, please eat me out. He he didn't want to, but he would kind of just like make like he would just I'd be like, Can you eat me out? And then he'd start doing something else to me. Cause just, you know, like avoidant. Mm-hmm. And then um, <laughs> or like he would tell me to use my vibrator on myself while I like sucked his dick. So I feel like he didn't have to do work. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know. Like his dick, his dick just hit my G spot really great. And I think he relied on that a lot, mm-hmm. but he didn't try to do anything else or he would like finger me. But like when he fingered me, he'd make me start bleeding all over the place. And I'm like, do you need to like cut your nails or something? Because like that shouldn't be happening. Yeah. I think most, um, the, you know, when I've talked to like lots of different sex experts and, you know, I've obviously talked to a lot of sex workers and they like kind of talk about the advice that they give to guys. One of like the one things that I hear over and over again is to take your time because I think for guys, it's very easy for them to get to like zero from zero to 60, like kind of right away, you know, they yeah. can get hard and like be ready to go right away. But like women take time, like they're like a fire that you need to like stoke and, you know, like slowly let it grow. And so yeah. you can't really start usually eating a girl out and she's going to come in like five seconds. Some girls are like that, See, if you but most girls are not. Hitachi on me. Yeah. But that's like this incredibly powerful, like <laughs> battery operated fucking like <laughs> massager. Like, two minutes. like you have to come. It's like, it like makes you. I like went live yesterday and like, like I, once I hit like a certain tip goal, I was like, all right, I'm going to start using my Hitachi. And after like two minutes, I'm like, all right, I need to put it away. Cause I'm about to squirt and you guys have not hit this like tip goal to have me squirt. Yeah. <laughs> so let's get to that tip goal. Cause it's like, I got so close way sooner than I thought I was going to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. It just makes sense. And, um, being eaten out, honestly, I haven't come from being eaten out yet. Cause I, I definitely get like a little like frightened. I, I, every guy I've ever hooked up with when I squirt, they all think it's gross. I've never had a guy who's like, Oh my God, that's the coolest thing ever. So I get stage fright, like coming in front uh. of people that aren't my only fans people. Cause my only fans, <laughs> subs are like oh my god that is the coolest thing I've ever seen and then people in person are like I have to like go clean that up now and I'm like I'm sorry can't help it that's such a shame (laughs) that is really sad it's crazy because like um a guy told me he thought it was gross and I basically trained my body to stop squirting for the longest time until my only fans and people were like begging for squirt content so I was like all right let's see if I can like bring it back Mm -hmm. so I was able to bring it back and now I'm like fuck like then I squirted in front of a guy like I think it was it was like this guy who I was like kind of talking to around this time last year actually best guy I've ever fucked in bed I thought I was in love with him hated his person not hated but like if you it was just us two in a room it's like we we couldn't have a conversation that lasted a mm-hmm. while, but I thought I was in love with him because like the way he used my vibrator and his dick game. And like, he just like knew what he was doing, his finger game, everything. Um, but like, I forgot what my point was, but he could use my hit top. Oh wait. Oh, I squirted in front of him. And I was just like, and I remember just kind of like, he kind of like made a face. I don't think he like meant for me to like see it. I was like, Oh, like, do you like it when girls squirt? And he was like, I mean, He's like, I definitely don't like dislike it. It's just also like not something I get like turned on by. And I'm like, why well, know what that means? He's grossed out. Yeah, I don't <laughs> dislike it, but I don't like it. No, there's usually it's one or the other, dude. There's yeah. no like middle ground with squirting because it's, you know. It's um, it's everywhere. Yeah. So then I would try to like make a point again to like not squirt because yeah. I was just like so embarrassed. And for him, he was like so sexual, such like a very open to trying things sexually. And I'm just like. Okay, if he doesn't even like squirting, I need to tone it back. Yeah. Isn't it funny how one guy can make you feel like so shitty about yourself and how a group of strangers online can make you feel (laughs) so good about yourself? Yeah. Strange, right? It's really funny because like I just feel like people in real life um, like and it's funny (laughs) ever since like I'd say elementary school. No, just my whole life. Let's just say my whole life men have never been into me romantically. Like men are, you know, they'll think I'm hot, get to know me. My personality for some reason just ruins it for men. And like in high school, it's like I would hook up with guys and it's like they never would want to date me. And like just no one was really like romantically interested in me for such a long time. And then I get all these strangers on the internet being like, Oh my God, be my wife, be my girlfriend, just like me being myself. And I'm like, that's so weird. Cause men in real life never do this. Like never, like they'll want to fuck me, but they'll also like treat me like less than a person. So I'm like, I just don't really hook up with people in real life. That's honestly another reason I like hooking up with girls better too. Cause it's like, they don't treat me like less than a person when I'm eating their pussy or they're eating mine. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But men tend to do that. Yeah. Well, it just sounds like you're meeting the wrong guys. So I'm going to manifest some good men coming into your life. That's well, okay. Here I have a lot of really good guy friends, a lot of like, 
And I mean, I wouldn't want them to want to hook up with me. I wouldn't want them to want anything romantic with me, but like, I love them, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but like romantically, no men just have never been that interested in me. Yeah. That's hard, man. Dating stuff. Yeah. But that's what makes like meeting the right guy special, you know? Yeah. I just, I mean, I think the universe has been yelling at me to deal with my trauma before I I, meet a guy and I've been like dealing with it and it's awful. Like I actually tried this last night. Um, I got prescribed ketamine months ago and I just, I've always hated ketamine Mm -hmm. and, um, it's for my anxiety because I, I'm anxious, Mm -hmm. um, constantly. So then last night I was like, you know what? Cause my anxiety gets like really bad at night and then I can't go to sleep. I'm like, let me try to take ketamine before sleep and just like meditate. I meditated for like a whole 45 minutes or something came out feeling so peaceful, went to bed. I even felt better this morning, just like a lot more at peace. And I'm like, oh, well, it can be nice, Mm -hmm. I guess, at times. Like there was a reason the doctor prescribed it to me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I've never tried ketamine, but I do. uh, I do usually meditate before I go to bed every night and that Mm -hmm. helps a ton. And I can't really meditate without it because then the intrusive thoughts just take over. And then it's like I'm fighting with myself in my head. There are the thoughts being like... (laughs) <laughs> you're not meant for this life. And then there's other thoughts being like, yes, I am. And, um, it's just like, basically it's like a fight between not believing in myself and trying to believe in myself. Yeah. Yeah. I, man, I've been there. I've been there. <laughs> well, Adelia, thank you so much for coming by. It's been such a yeah, pleasure getting to you. know you. Um, can you tell everybody, uh, where they can find you online? Yes. Uh, you can find basically all of my websites at it's deals, I T S D E E L Z dot com. Um, it's just a lot easier doing that because my Instas get deleted a lot. My TikTok gets deleted, but you'll find all the updated links there. Smart. <laughs> and you guys can find me, at least for now, um, on Instagram and on Twitter at Holly Randall. My TikTok is still holding strong, but who knows if it'll still be there by the time this episode comes out. Um, it's Holly Randall Unfiltered. And you can actually now join my YouTube channel. I'm doing just a really low priced membership for $2.99 a month where you can get special badges next to your name and special emojis that you can use in live chats and um, in comments. And then also I'll be offering some exclusive and early release videos as well. So go check that out. And of course, though, for all of my exclusive content, the most amount of stuff that you're going to find is at my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for being here and I'll see you next week.